If you have a Bible, you can open up to Acts chapter 2 this morning to begin with. As you're turning to that, let me just remind you, uh, two weeks ago we talked about what are the th- marks of uh, the, the, the characteristics of a biblical church from Acts chapter 2 and a little bit from other places in Acts. And then last week we talked about how the traditions of men can make void the Word of God. The things that we add to what God's Word says that aren't necessarily sinful, but they do become a problem when they become more important than what God's Word says. And so we have to be very discerning about all of the things that churches add to their church life to say, okay, is this good? And if it's good, let's not let it become more important to us than the Word of God. And so this week, we'll finish this little mini-series in the middle of our time in Romans, because we'll be back to Romans chapter 8 next Lord's Day, God willing, to talk about what is church membership. So I want to read several short passages out of Acts to start off with. If you're looking at Acts chapter 2, verse 41, Peter has preached that great sermon at uh, Pentecost. He's told them, repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then it says in verse 41, then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them, that is to the church there in Jerusalem. If you jump ahead to chapter 4, verse 4, persecution is on, Peter and John are arrested, And as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, one of the things that causes the church to grow historically is persecution. Nobody wants it. Nobody wants to look for it, but God uses it. And in chapter 4, verse 4, however, many of those who heard the word believed during time of persecution, and the number of men, just the men alone in the church, came to be about 5,000. Now, if you jump ahead to chapter 6, this will be the last portion, a little bit longer. Chapter 6, verse 1, Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, the church was growing, there arose a complaint. Wait a minute. Remember we said one of the marks of a biblical church is a biblical church has problems. If you find a church that doesn't have problems, keep moving. Because it isn't a biblical church. Because biblical church have people in them. And part of our sanctification is learning to love one another the way Christ loves us, even when other people are stepping on our toes. So here the church is growing, and you think, oh, well, all is well, and everybody's happy. No, there were complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, that's the Greek Jews, because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Why do they get what we don't want, or what we want and aren't getting? Of course, none of us have ever thought anything like that. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we, the apostles, should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Some organization is being developed in this new church. But we, the apostles, later on would be applicable to the elders of the church. We will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. The church together said, okay, that sounds good. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmeus, Parmeans, uh, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when, when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. There's something official going on here. Don't miss this. Then, after there was more organization to take care of the people in the church, then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests, even the Jewish priests, were obedient to the faith. These are the words of the living God. You can be seated at Well, what I've just read to you are a few of the key passages that reveal a growing measure of organization in the early church that have long been recognized by biblical scholars as the formation of church membership. Add to these the simple fact that the vast majority of the books in the New Testament were not written to individual Christians to be read on their mountain retreat or on their lonely walks on the beach, but in the church, in the church. Uh, 
And what do they speak about? A lot of these books, they speak about things such as leadership in the church, structure in the church, even the necessity of church discipline, which reveals a measure of organization in the churches, which historically have been recognized the way you do these things is you have some sort of church membership. Now, some insist that the word membership is not in the Bible. Oh, it's not. Neither is the word trinity, but we believe in that. Neither are fluorescent lights, but we depend on them. Uh, But beyond those kinds of defenses, are we not one body made up of many members united together? Let me read to you. It's a memory verse for many in discipleship. Romans chapter 12, verse 4 and 5. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. You say, well, that's symbolic. What's it symbolic of? It's symbolic of the unity, the connectedness, and indeed the membership of the church of Jesus Christ. Now, a little history lesson. You know, some of us live in the past. Um, Until the 1960s. Now, for some of you, that's ancient days. For some of you, you weren't alive. Some of us were. But until the 1960s, every kind of Christian church had some kind of membership. What changed in the 60s? Well, rank individualism. Nobody over 30 should ever be trusted. Remember thinking those kinds of things? (laughs) When I get 30, stop trusting me. That's all I can say. Um, Rank individualism that says, you know, we throw off all sorts of restraint, but it not only hit the cultures and particularly the campuses, but it was also the time of the rise in the church of non-denominationalism, something that before the 1960s, that means for 1960 plus years, no one had ever heard of non-denominationalism. And now it's a badge. What are you? I'm non-denominational. What does that mean? Don't know, but I'm proud of it. <laughs> what did non-denominationalism build into the church? It's baked into the cake now. It introduced the abandonment of accountability of churches to anybody else other than them, their own church. So as Protestants, you have little papacies dotting the map where the theology is based on what the pastor thinks. Does that sound like a good idea? It doesn't to me. That's why we're a confessional church. We look at, we look at a historic confession of faith and say, no, this is what the Bible teaches sort of topically. We won't get off into that other than to say, Jim and I have been praying and talking. We're probably in in the coming weeks, we're going to start introducing just reading a paragraph out of the confession each week as a, as a doctrinal point for our church to always be anchored. But back to the matter at hand. Not only did non-denominationalism make a bunch of individual papacies with their individual popes everywhere who are answerable to no one, unless God will kill them, which is not the best way to get rid of a pastor. Um, But it also, along with non-denominationalism, giving individuality to the church, many of those churches became opponents of the concept of membership, rank individualism. We're all just our own people. I'm just going to tell you my opinion. You could take it or you can leave it, but my opinion is this has hurt rather than helped the church. Regardless of how many people you lead to Christ, if you lead them to Christ but you don't lead them to understanding the church, you haven't helped the kingdom. Jesus came to save his people, plural, united, one, his church. He preached more about the kingdom of God than any other thing. He didn't talk about individual people with individual personal relationships with Jesus. Although that's true, that's not the end of what it means to be a Christian. We become members of his church. So this morning, uh, I want to do an overview of church membership as we understand it. This is kind of half sermon and half uh, kind of a family business to just... So for people who are members, be be reminded of what it means. 
For people who are not members of our church, who this is your church, be instructed. And if you have questions, feel free to ask. So the first thing we're going to say, and it's on your outline, the first point is the question, is it biblical? And the answer is yes. I think I've just presented membership is how the church does what the church is supposed to be doing, caring for the flock and the flock being united together and committed and accountable to one another. Rick Anderson, a dear friend of our church, years ago said to me, commenting on 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2, where Peter tells the elders, shepherd the flock of God which is among you. And Rick said, how can elders shepherd the flock when the sheep don't want to be recognized as a part of the flock? How do you, how do you shepherd the flock of God which is among you if you don't know who is among you? It's just ships passing in the night. Now, from there, I want to jump into going over a booklet that looks like this. It's called Church Membership, and it's primarily what our church constitution says about membership with, in a different font, comments explaining it. I'm going to shorten that and give you the high points this morning. And if you're interested in more, or if it's been, or even if you're a member and it's been some time since you looked at these, get one of these and remember what it means. Remember what it means. So here we go. Number one, the nature and purpose of church membership. All Christians automatically become members of the universal church when we're born again. When we're born again, we're born into the family of God. We're born into the church, the universal church. Membership in a local church is, as taught by in the Bible, is voluntary. Listen, but it's not trivial. Local church membership is a commitment to service and a commitment to mutual accountability. We're not lone rangers. We're not on our own. We're, we're members of one another, even though we're different, as I read from Romans chapter uh, 12, verse 4 and 5. All Christians are members of the universal church, but have you noticed it's pretty hard to serve and be accountable to the universal church because it's so big and it covers the whole planet. I mean, how do you volunteer to be an usher in the universal church of Jesus Christ? How do you volunteer to teach Sunday school? How do you volunteer to do? How do you get involved in serving? Well, I'm a member of the Universal Church of Jesus Christ. We, if we're Christians, all of us are, who are Christians are members of that church. But God, in his wonderful wisdom, has ordained local churches as places to make tangible expressions of the universal church. Individual believers can participate and serve in local churches in ways we can't by merely saying, yeah, we're members of the universal church. That's great, but what does that mean, and how does that affect your life? Accountability is to three different places for members of the church. One is to the church, one is to the leadership, and one is to each other. We become accountable, we become members one of another. There's a difference between being a regular attender at Grace Bible Church and being a member of Grace Bible Church. And one of those differences is that while anybody and everybody is welcome to worship with us, to be a member, there's nine formal commitments to this church and to each other that members make. And I want to just run through them very rapidly. If you're jotting down notes, here's your chance to wake up and write. Some people I know, love, what, what's the blank? What's the blank? Listen to the words and then worry about the blank later. Uh, well, the first commitment is attending Sunday worship regularly. How can you be a member of a church if you don't ever go? or if you go very sparingly. We say 75% of the time, which I think is a pretty low bar. Exceptions, of course, would include illness, necessary work, or being out of town. And let me just say this about this. The commitment to say, I'm going to go to church, if you see this as something that you got to do instead of something that you get to do, you don't get it. Christians don't go to church because we got to. We go to church because we get to. We want to worship God with other Christians. We want to hear his word preached. We want to pray together. We want to sing together. We want to receive the Lord's Supper together. We want to witness baptisms together. We want to be the body of Christ. Not, oh, I got to go. I made this commitment. That isn't a good reason to have that commitment. Here's the second thing. Second uh, commitment is participating 
in the ministry by serving. Now, we recognize that all believers have varying gifts. Depending on our age and health, we have various different amounts of strength and ability. We understand that. And time. Depending on where you are in life, you, some of you work hundreds of hours a week, it seems. I get it. Uh, but recognizing that not all members of the church are going to serve in the exact same ways, members serve rather than merely attending in order to what? Be served. Members say, no, I want to be a part of this. It's not a cruise ship where you wait for the, the mint on your pillow at night. It's a warship, so grab an oar and pull. We work together. We work together as a body. Here's the third one. Members participate in the ministry through biblical giving. Biblical giving is regular, it's proportional, and according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, it's offered in faith. Now, we do teach that, uh, that tithing is a biblical baseline, but it is not required for membership. I just want to give a little footnote to that. It was brought to our attention recently that something in our membership packet made at least some people feel as though, oh, tithing is required, as though we're, we want to see your W-2s, you know. It was, it was clarified. We, we amended that to say, no, tithing is not required of members of this church. So set your heart at rest. Again, giving is not something you got to do. It's something you get to do to be a part of it. If you got to do it, you could keep it. God doesn't need your money. He doesn't need my money. He doesn't even need us. He allows us to be a part of his body. And throughout the history of the world, people have given as a part of their worship. So be that clarified. The fourth thing is receiving the Lord's Supper regularly and frequently as administered by the church. Hopefully you want to receive the Lord's Supper. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you should want to receive the Lord's Supper. And we administer the Lord's Supper twice a month on Sunday mornings, and you should want to be as a, a part of that. We've already uh, talked in previous times about being baptized, so we won't cover that. That's already understood. The fifth one is concurring with Grace Bible Church statement of faith. Concurring doesn't mean you agree with every single point, because we're all in different stages of our growth and of our understanding, but it's just an interesting thing nowadays. Sometimes churches, they don't want you to read a statement of faith. You've got to look so hard to even find one on their website. And then when you do, you find something that's so generic that anybody, almost anybody could agree with it. But it doesn't say anything specific about here's how we understand the scriptures on important issues. That's why, as I mentioned a little while earlier, a part of our statement of faith includes the London Baptist Confession of Faith, which is old, 1689. It gives us historic anchors to say, we're not making this up as we go along. Um, so, and again, it's just pretty obvious. Well, I don't agree with anything the church teaches, but I want to be a member. Eh, probably not the best fit. Probably not the best fit. Number six, willingly submitting to the spiritual leadership of the elders of the church. Key words as they submit to God and the scriptures. If you think the elders are leading the church in unbiblical ways, let's talk about it. Let us understand one another. Maybe maybe something wasn't clear. Maybe it's a misunderstanding. That's usually what it is. Um, but maybe we need correction, or maybe you do. But let us talk about it together. And to be sure, uh, it's you, you follow the leadership of whatever local church you're a member of, as they follow the Lord and the Bible, if they deviate from that, if we deviate from that, the first thing to do is not run. The first thing to do is to come and say, what's going on here? Help us understand. This doesn't seem biblical. And let us reason together. This is where not only does the church hold the members accountable, but the members hold the church accountable. It goes both ways. It goes both ways. Here's a seventh one. Pursuing peace in all relationships in the church. Now this one, you'd kind of think this doesn't need to be said, but yeah, it does. Because it, the church is made up of people. Didn't we just read in, in Acts that people were complaining? How come they're getting stuff that we're not getting? Believe it or not, that kind of thing can actually happen today. 
I know it's hard to stretch your imagination to get it wrapped around that, but things like that happen. But we, com- we covenant together as members of a church that we're going to pursue peace in all relationships within the church. This means speaking positively about the church. It means speaking positively about your leaders. It means speaking positively about one another. It also includes dealing biblically with persons with whom we may have some problems, according to Matthew chapter 18. In other words, I got a problem with this person over here. I don't go to six other people and tell them about it. No, I go to that person and say, well, let's work this out. We got to do things biblically as a church. And as members of a church, we make a commitment to say, yeah, we want to pursue peace in all relationships. And the way to do that is to do what God's Word says. If you've got a problem with someone, go to the person. If that doesn't seem to sort it out, ask for someone else to go with you. Not someone to help you gang up on the other person, but someone who's going to hold both of you accountable to be biblical and loving and to try to find common ground and to, to expose error if it's necessary. But we want to pursue peace Uh, as best we can. Number eight, promising to seek the counsel of elders regarding withdrawing membership and or changing churches before the decision is made. I will say that this is one that it's it's in the church covenant that you sign when you're members. Yes, this is part of it. And this is one that I'm sorry to say, but nine times out of 10, people don't do this. They don't say, you know, we're kind of concerned about what's going on in our church here to so help. And, you know, it's, let's talk about it. Or maybe even we're concerned enough that we're contemplating maybe changing churches. Let's talk about it. Not sending an email that says, dear staff, we're attending a different church. You know, if we're supposed to shepherd the flock of God, which is among us, speaking to elders, First Peter chapter 5, how can we shepherd people with a major decision? Changing churches is, should be considered a major decision for a Christian. It's not to say you can never change churches, because marriage is still death to us part, but church membership is not. Sometimes it's time to, to change. And, but we want to say, what are the biblical reasons? What are we doing? Is it a misunderstanding? Is there things that we can work out? Or whatever the case may be. But we can't help shepherd you or your family through a big decision if is all we get is an email saying we're not coming here anymore. So again, that's, that's that accountability factor. Number nine, understanding that membership at Grace Bible Church is renewed annually. You know, even the auto club does this. Uh, of course, they give you a bill to renew you. We don't, we don't do that. But the concept is, once a year, after someone becomes a member of our church, one or two of the officers of the church, maybe a deacon and an elder, maybe two elders, two deacons, whatever, will make an appointment to just sit down and say, how are you doing? How can we pray for you? How's your family doing? Are you, do you feel connected with the church? Do you have questions about the church? How can we minister to you? So at least once a year, we, we, we really try to sit down with every member to say, how can we pray for you? How can we serve you better? Let us know. It's not to come and read you the riot act. It's to say, now's your chance. Let us know how we can help you and better serve you. Uh, I will add a footnote to that. In defense of the officers of the church, sometimes they say, well, we've tried and tried and tried and tried, and we either can't get an appointment made, or when we do, it gets canceled. Help us out. You've only got one appointment a year to make. These guys have sometimes several a month to make. So when someone gets says, "Hey, can we? It's time for your membership renewal. Let let your heart be ready to move heaven and earth to make that happen, so that it doesn't just get put off, put off, put off, put off." So there's there's that. Um, we haven't always done that, but when we started doing that, I'll just give you a little insight. Sometimes people would be drifting, and we really weren't aware of it. And then all of a sudden, it's like, wow, now for us to go and say what's going on, it looks confrontational. But if once a year we sit down with every member of the church and say, how can we pray for you? What's going on in your life? What's going on in your family? How's, how are things? Um, at least once a year, we're doing a checkup to see how can we best serve you. That's the purpose of this. And we're not the only church in the world that does this. Honestly, to be truthful, when we first initiated this, 
I didn't know of any, but I, I found out that uh, one of my daughters who lives in another city, their church does this too. And they, and being a PK, preacher's kid, she's, you know, talks with the pastors and pastor's wives, and they say, it is so hard to get people to make these appointments. We don't know anything about that. Anyway. Um, next thing on the list, requirements and procedures regarding church membership. Before accepting a person as a member of Grace Bible Church, there's a few things, and we're not, I didn't print all these in your bullets, and so you can just listen. If you want to learn more about these, pick up one of these booklets or get a membership uh, application packet. Um, you need to be a baptized believer in Jesus Christ. I mean, baptism is not an option for the super saints. Baptism is required for Christians. So if you say, I'm a Christian, but I'm not baptized, well, let's, we'll fill the tank. It's time. You need to be a baptized believer in Jesus Christ. You need to be a believer in Jesus Christ, not just I like the people here, which would probably bring into question whether you're a good judge of character. But that's another story. That's another story. Number two, you've got to be living a lifestyle that doesn't contradict your profession of faith. This doesn't say anything about being sinless, but if someone's living blatantly, openly in sin, let's address that together, and then we'll talk about membership. Demonstrate a commitment to the ministry here for a minimum of three months. That's pretty, pretty short, I would say, but the idea is I went to this church once. I really liked it. Where do I sign up? Give us a chance to offend you first. <laughs> It happens. No, listen, when offense is given in a biblical church and it happens, it's hardly ever done maliciously. It's done thoughtlessly. It's done with, without. Let us work it. Let us work through it. So in three months, there's got to be something that you don't like that you have to deal with, whether or not you like it still. Uh, that's not to try to discourage people. It's just to try to make sure we, you know, I mean, first date, let's get married. Maybe not so good. Demonstrate a commitment to the ministry of, oh, I said that, three months. Be 18 years of age. you got to be 18 to be a member, and the reason why is because we don't want someone with 12 kids to tip the balance on voting. Kidding. Um, but uh, there are a couple things, which we'll talk about in a minute, that the membership votes on in our church. And um, you'll, when you hear what they are, you might be surprised. Uh, be 18 years of age for the purpose of voting. And then... Be willing to submit to the, excuse me, the government of the church. Do you, do you believe these elders are called by God to be elders of this church? That's important. And then apply by member, apply for membership. It's very simple. There's a membership packet. We put some on the communion table this morning, so you could pick one up if you want to. We don't do a baptism class. We're not against having a, no, excuse me, not baptism, membership. We don't do a membership class, not because we're opposed to classes, but we just don't ever have that many people wanting to join the church at the same time to make a class make sense. It's kind of, we're going to have a class, and you're the student. You know, that's just kind of awkward. It's just kind of awkward. Um, and then you interview with a couple of the elders, and then if everything is good, and we still like each other. Uh, then you can become a member by submitting an application and then signing the roll sheet. We have a roll sheet, so we remember it's been 12 months. It's time for your follow-up visits every 12 months. Termination of church membership, number three. Membership can be, deter can be terminated in the following ways. A member can ask to terminate the membership. I no longer want to be a member. Please speak to us before you're deciding, maybe it's a misunderstanding that can be addressed. Membership may be terminated for non-participation if appropriate efforts to restore fellowship and participation have failed. Someone doesn't ever come to church. After a while, we say, do you still want to be a part of this church? And even if they say yes, and they still don't ever want to come to church, we have to say, well, maybe you should find a church that you want to attend. We don't want to be, the, we don't want to be oh, my church is this. I don't go there, but that's my church. So that's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, Elders can terminate a person's membership as an act of discipline. If someone is habitually living in open, scandalous sin and won't repent, the Bible is very clear on this, in 1 Corinthians particularly, but in other places as well. It's, it's, the point is not to get rid of people. The point is to call people to repentance and to help people. Church membership can be, to, well, not can be, it will be terminated on death. There are some churches who've got hundreds of people. The church has been around since the 1800s. They never take anybody off the rolls. Three-quarters of the people on the church roll are in the church victorious in heaven now. 
So they're not, their membership has moved on to a better place, okay? <laughs> and we're good with that. Well, the next thing is voting in church membership. Each member is entitled to vote on, to one vote each uh, in matters, just to, so that people don't question the legitimacy of the elections. Um, on the, on the decisions that require a vote of the membership. Is anybody curious what those two things are? The hiring and firing of the pastor. The church holds the, church holds the leadership accountable. And so that has, that's not happened yet because the church started in my living room and no one's wanted to get rid of me that badly yet. But I'm not getting any younger and some of you probably will be in the foreseeable future gathered together to vote on a new pastor. I mean, I, I don't have my hand on the panic bar to get out the door or anything like that, but uh, just be aware that that's the members vote on this. Members vote on this. We don't look to our association of churches to assign a pastor to us. We are a member, our church, we're not a lone church. We're a part of an association of churches, but that's not what they do. They don't assigned pastors. Number five, discipline and church membership. What is, this really is what does accountability look like? And there's more about this in the booklet called Church Membership than I'm going to go over here. I'm just going to hit some high points. The Bible is clear about the need to call members living in unrepentant state of sin to repentance. It's part of the job of the church to call, you know, it's not just looking for for sheep that have strayed, but for sheep that are staying in the pen and causing problems and living in sin. We don't come with guns blazes. We come to say, how can we help you? What's going on? Um, if the sin is serious and if a member refuses to repent after repeated attempts to counsel the member as a last-ditch effort, a member may be disfellowshipped. And the goal of this rare occurrence is not to get rid of sheep, but to follow what God's Word says so that people will say, I need to repent. And then when people repent, they're restored to full membership. And just so you know, um, in 38 years, this church has gone to that last-ditch effort, I think, five times. And in several of them, they have resulted in people repenting. See, what do you know? God's Word was right once again. Shock, shock, shock. And when a person who has been disfellowshipped repents, open arms. We celebrate God has, has brought you to repentance. The church, the officers in particular, commit to shepherding the souls of members. We do much the same for those who are not members, but the level of commitment is not the same as it is for members. Why? Not because we love you less? No, because you haven't made a commitment to be a part of us. So our commitment is a little bit different to members than it is to those who are not. The commitment of members in return. At the end of the membership application, by the way, the application for membership is much shorter than the paperwork for buying a new, a new or used car. Just want to let you know that. It's not daunting. It's two sides of one piece of paper, most of it lines that you can write answers in. But at the end of this, at the end of this, um, there are there are points that you are making a commitment to do. Now, in olden days, when I was a little boy growing up in church, back before the dinosaurs were extinct, um, we called it a church covenant. I don't know if any of you grew up in a church that had church covenant. When you join the church, you covenant for certain things. And by signing, you're saying, I'm, I'm committing to these things. What are these things? Um, there are... I flipped all these pages and I forgot where I was. Here it is. Good news is it's almost the end. Um, nine points. And there's no nothing to put the blanks in because I didn't want to weary you with that. But I'm just going to read through these things and make very small comment because most of them I've already mentioned. When you say I want to be a member of the church, here's what you're saying. Number one, I will faithfully attend the regular meetings of the church and special meetings called by the leadership. I want to be a part of this. If there's a family business meeting, I want to be there. I want to be there for worship. 
I will participate in the ministry of church by using my spiritual gifts and service. I'm not just here to get, I'm here to give. I will participate financially in the ministry of the church. That's what you give and how you give is between you and the Lord, but you're making a commitment. And by the way, on the uh, annual checkup, we don't say, show us your checkbook and your giving records. No, we just say, are you worshiping the Lord with your finances the way God would have you do it? And if you're good with that, we're good with that. I will receive the Lord's Supper regularly and frequently as administered by the church. This is more important than most people think nowadays. Most, most evangelical Christians have a very low view of the, of the Lord's Supper, and we shouldn't. This is something commanded by Jesus and given to us, and we need to take it seriously. And when the Lord's Supper is being administered, we, we want to do this as a, as a part of our worship. Number five, I agree with and embrace the church, uh, Grace Bible Church's statement of faith, including the London Baptist Confession, vision statement, and distinctives. I will submit to the spiritual leaders of the church unless conscience demands otherwise. In other words, you think we're doing something wrong, in which case I'll speak to the elders for the sake of clarity and mutual understanding, and I desire to be held accountable by the church, including church discipline if necessary. I will speak positively about the church, the leaders, and other congregants, and I'll seek to stop any talk to the contrary. You don't want the wildfire of gossip in a church. You want people who love one another, and the Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. It doesn't say love converses about a multitude of sins. We want to we go to one another and care. Uh, I will speak positively about the church leaders of the congregants and stop any talk to the contrary. I will deal biblically with persons with whom any problems may arise according to Matthew chapter 18, 15 through 17. I will seek the counsel of the elders regarding withdrawing my membership and or changing churches before a decision is made. We, we're, our, our goal isn't to talk you out of it. Our goal is to shepherd you to make the best decision that you think God wants you to make. And number nine, I understand that my membership will be reviewed annually for the purpose of discussing my spiritual health, participation, and commitment to the church with one of the officers, and even though it's not written there, and I won't make them chase me for this. <laughs> when they call and say, can we get together, help them by getting together. Hey, look, at this is a lot of business, not a typical sermon. We'll be back to Romans chapter 8, verse by verse next week, but it seemed to me that this was a wise thing. I didn't have this one on membership planned. I just had, I had one message planned on what is a church, and we, let's be careful of putting other things the churches do ahead of what God says churches should do. And by the time that was done, that was two messages. And by the time those two messages were done, let's, let's talk about membership. So that's three. Back to verse by verse through Romans 8 next time. If you have questions, please ask. Um, that's what we're here for, So try to help help straighten things out. If you're a member, be refreshed about what it means. When's the last time you read the membership packet? Um, if you're not a member, I pray that you see the value of spiritual membership. Ask questions, get a membership packet, ask questions. That's what it means to be a member of this church. And it's not so wildly different than many churches. I won't say most. I, it seems today in this day and age, there are many, 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 many churches who church membership means nothing. And so where's the accountability? Where's the commitment? Father in heaven, we thank you for this time to be in worship today. We thank you for the singing. We thank you for the praying. We thank you for the scripture readings. And we thank you, Father, for this reminder, even though it's more of a business meeting than it is a regular preaching time. I pray, God, that it encourages us that we would love your church even as Christ loved his church enough to die for her and to rise for her. May we love your church, Lord. May we not be those who say we love the Lord, but we can't stand him, his, his body. May we be those who, because we love the Lord, we love his church. Even though the church is not perfect, even though the church is made up of people who are imperfect, even as we all are imperfect. Use our relationships to your church to further sanctify us, to grow us in grace, that we might be forgiving. We're never more like your son than when we're forgiving. So may we learn to forgive. And in the church, we have opportunities to do that. 
And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.